In the year 1935, a young inventor by the name Stanton Avery created the very first self-adhesive label. This is widely agreed to be the inception and foundation for what we know today as the sticker. In the modern era, you can spot stickers in a wide variety of places, ranging from laptops to water bottles to that one guy who seriously has no shame putting anime titties all over his car. Dude, what the hell? Stickers have been known to bring joy to the masses for generations, myself included. Now that's a sticker. However, if you're part of a certain fandom, stickers hold an entirely different meaning. In the year 2006, an unknown indie studio by the name Nintendo released their moderately successful title, New Super Mario Bros. for the Nintendo DS. This creation would serve as the foundation for what we know today as the New Super Mario Bros. series. This sub-series of Mario games was a return to form, boiling Mario down to its most basic and bare-bones essentials, and it was rather successful. The New Super Mario Bros. series would receive a sequel in 2009 on the Nintendo Wii, and then two more sequels in 2012, which just so happens to be the year where the worlds of Stickers and Mario collide. And to many, it was the year that a beloved franchise of paper-themed video games died. Today, I'm going to tell you the story of Paper Mario Sticker Star and why it is easily the most despised game in the series. Uh, hi there. It's me, JJ the Zillennial. So, uh, things have changed quite a bit since I last made a video about the Paper Mario series. It would appear that I've wandered into a trap that I'm completely unable to escape, and I suppose that means that my only option is to continue the retrospective from the confines of this comically oversized tape. <sighs> You know, I should have known that a random whack a bump floating in a spooky void was too good to be true. But, uh, live and learn, I guess. If you're just now joining us on this quest, it might be a good idea to get caught up on the sequence of events that led me to the situation, including my new appearance. But a TLDR in case you just want to hear me trash the Paper Mario fandom's favorite punching bag, I'm on a quest to collect six magical relics known as the Paper Hearts. And to do so, I must speak about every game in the Paper Mario series. What makes this difficult is the fact that I need a sufficient amount of love for the game in question in order for a heart to appear. And like many a Paper Mario fan, I have some history with this particular game. Regardless, if I don't at least try, then I'll never have any hope of escaping and collecting all of the Paper Hearts. If I fail this mission, the friend who sent me on this quest will be gone forever. And the same will happen to this world that I call home. You probably saw all the gloomy spookiness happening in the background, so yeah, this is pretty serious. There's an evil being by the name of Sinister Dude who's trying to hunt me down, so I gotta take care of business before they find me. No more procrastinating. It's time to finally do this. Though, we're gonna have to tackle things a bit differently. So let's roll the intro, shall we? E3 2010. The 3DS was officially announced alongside a trailer for Kid Icarus Uprising and a tease for The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time 3D. But what got me incredibly hyped was the announcement of a brand new Paper Mario game specifically for the 3DS console. At this stage, very little was known about the title, but from the handful of screenshots that were uncovered and an incredibly blurry video taken on the show floor that makes this iteration of the game feel like a cryptid, it looked like, at least at this point, the game was shaping up to be a return to form. Something that was exciting after Super Paper Mario deviated from the established Paper Mario formula. Though, to many, it was also kind of strange seeing Paper Mario on a portable console, given that portables had their own dedicated line of Mario RPGs, that being the Mario & Luigi series. Nonetheless, more Paper Mario is never anything to complain about, right? E3 2011 was when we'd see the game again, this time in the form of a full trailer. And at this point, every Paper Mario fan around the world was hyped. Sure, the game seemed pretty standard, but it's not like Nintendo was about to give everything away in the first trailer. You know, you gotta leave some surprises for when you get the game in your hands. So there I was, waiting patiently. 
As someone who only played Super Paper Mario and the very first game, I was very excited and quite open to whatever direction this new game would take. This was, without a shadow of a doubt, the 3DS game that I personally was most excited for, and for as long and agonizing as the wait felt, it was only a matter of time until release day. I vividly remember waiting up until midnight to download the game directly to my 3DS, and that night, I spent many hours playing the game. Paper Mario Sticker Star then proceeded to take over any and all free time that I had for a good few weeks. But of course, games must end, so eventually, I found myself at the very end of the game. And it was only once I beat the final boss and the credits started rolling that I reflected on my experience and came to a bit of a shocking realization. I think this game might be bad. And I think my experience sums up how the majority of Paper Mario fans felt. Look, I wish I could come at this video with a unique perspective and some revolutionary hot take along the lines of Paper Mario Sticker Star is actually better than you remember. But let's not kid ourselves. This is a bad video game. It may not look like it, especially if you're not as experienced with the series, but I can assure you, the fans who bitch about Paper Mario Sticker Star are mostly right. But then the question becomes, why are they right? And is there anything redeeming about this game? Well, mm, complaints have nothing to do with the game being broken or glitchy or having predatory practices or even that it lacks content. At the core of why this game is so vehemently despised are three overarching design principles. And so that's how we're going to be tackling this whole thing. And we'll start with what seems insignificant, but what is arguably the most notable and controversial aspect of modern day Paper Mario, the story and characters. So imagine, you played Super Paper Mario, and you got to experience the most involved and complex story of any game with Mario in the title. The twists, the turns, the deep assortment of original characters, new locations that we've never seen before. Now imagine what that game's sequel would look like. Okay, here's a quick summary. Mario, Peach, and all the Toads of the Mushroom Kingdom are celebrating the annual Sticker Fest. At the center of the event is a magical comet that grants wishes. The moment the comet lands, Bowser and his minions show up. He touches the comet, gaining a new ultra-powered stickery form. The screen fades to white, and Mario is crumpled into a little paper ball. Upon decrumbling himself, Mario befriends Kirsty, a floating guardian sticker who tells Mario that he needs to venture to the many regions of the Mushroom Kingdom to get the powerful MacGuffins known as the Royal Stickers. Mario sets off on his quest, defeating each chapter's boss, and at the end, he has a big boss fight with Bowser. And he wins. Roll credits. It may sound like I glossed over a lot, but trust me when I say, I really didn't. This game's plot is, uh, uh, do I really want to say the line? No, you know what? Calling it paper thin would be generous. Story? What story? Things just kind of happen. Previous games consisted of eight chapters, which had self-contained stories and little sections in between chapters that filled in the overarching story and built up to the final boss. By contrast, Sticker Star consists of five chapters, plus a short little final gauntlet that the game considers chapter six, but like, let's be real, it's not. Within these chapters, there's not generally a story tying everything together. There's no cutting to the villains to hear about their evil schemes, in fact, Bowser literally never says a single word, but we will come back to that. The most often criticized sin that this game commits, at least within fan circles, is the complete absence of any original characters whatsoever. And of the NPCs and side characters that do exist, none are allowed to deviate from the cookie cutter presentation of the basic default design types in the Mario games. Every Goomba looks the same. Every Koopa looks the same, and most infamously, nearly every NPC is a toad. But not just any toad, this specific toad, sometimes in different colors. And if you're really lucky today, you might just get a pair of sunglasses. Character design is my passion. Now, I hear you. This sounds like a really petty and inconsequential thing to complain about, but these details are emblematic of the safe, bland, corporate influence which has festered Paper Mario's identity from this game on. 
an issue that bled over from the mainline Mario games and even afflicted other Mario spin-offs. Mario has always had a reputation for being experimental and innovative, but as soon as New Super Mario Bros. Wii came out, things shifted. There are four games in the New Super Mario Bros. series, and while it's disingenuous to call them all the exact same thing, functionally, they're basically the same as one another. Recycling music, enemies, power-ups, graphics, and level structures. In these games, Mario ventures through grasslands, deserts, beaches, jungles, volcanoes, ice lands, rocky sky hills, and finally Bowser's Castle. It's the basic standard Mario routine with little to no variation. The new Super Mario Bros. games are well made. Mechanically, there's nothing wrong with them, and they're more than decent in a vacuum. But with the context of the greater Mario brand, these are incredibly stale and standard. But at the same time, they also sell better than the more experimental games. Because when your average Joe Schmo picks up a Mario game, this is what they expect. This default plastic looking corporate Mario that was designed to appeal to the masses and which didn't really take risks wasn't just relegated to the new Super Mario Bros. series, but could even be seen within games like Super Mario 3D Land, Mario Party 9, and Mario Kart 7. I don't know, DS and Wii aren't exactly good names, but there's a bit more to chew on here, I guess. Only more recently with games like Super Mario Odyssey and Super Mario Bros. Wonder is Mario able to be more than just its basic elements. Paper Mario in particular, especially given that it's a spin-off of the mainline series, was defined by its experimentation and creativity, its freedom to do new and unique things within the Mario universe. The very first game in the Paper Mario series is pretty basic compared to the two games that came after, but even back in 2001, on the Nintendo 64, there were varied and unique characters with distinct designs, chapters that had fun little self-contained stories, and unique locations like Shy Guy's Toy Box, The Flower Fields, and Star Haven. Even when more standard themes are used, the other elements compensate and provide fun spins on those settings and ideas. It's also been more than two decades since the first Paper Mario game came out, so I feel like we can be a little more generous towards it. The Thousand Year Door came out just a few short years later and went even harder with the unique locations and unique characters and storylines. In a lot of ways, it was the first game, but tenfold. Paper Mario Sticker Star, on the other hand, does the bare minimum to facilitate a reason for Mario to do things that you as the player make him do in worlds that are just standard Mario biomes played straight, culminating in a chapter boss fight that's just a normal enemy, but big. There's no personality to these bosses, no characterization, no back and forth banter, no rivalry. They're just random enemies that have been brainwashed by corrupted stickers. Admittedly, the environments that these events take place in are well crafted and pretty to look at, but they also feel hollow. Chapters are split up into sub-levels similar to Super Paper Mario, only these sub-levels are selected from a world map, a la New Super Mario Bros., which, on the face of it, is kind of an understandable decision as it lends itself to the portable nature of this installment in the series. But the consequence of doing things this way is that it fragments the world and makes it feel a lot smaller than it was likely meant to be. In fact, there's only a single town in the game, that being Toad Town. The very first Paper Mario game had several towns, at least one per chapter, and Toad Town itself was the sprawling hub that creatures from all around the world would stop at. Occasional story events would take place here, and it even housed an entire underground labyrinth. But in this game, Toad Town is reduced to a tiny assortment of houses, with its only purpose being to buy items and fling them at a tarp. Oof, these things are expensive. Looks like I'll need to cut to an ad break so I can get some money to purchase some stickers. Also, patreon.com slash lineal dissonance. <laughs> In early beta screenshots of Paper Mario Sticker Star, you could see that Mario is traveling around with a Chain Chomp companion. This kind of thing would be scrapped. And in its place, uh, nothing, actually. There are absolutely zero partners in the game, which has massive story and pacing ramifications, and also severely affects gameplay, but we'll talk about that in the next section. For now, the important thing to note is that partners were incredibly important to how chapters were paced, and gave Mario a direct throughline to connect more with the area and its unique storyline. Instead, we have a single original character who joins Mario, 
that being Kirsty, who assumes a role similar to Tippy from Super Paper Mario or a companion in a Zelda game. She's a guide who tells Mario what to do and speaks for him in those rare instances where the game decides to have dialogue. The thing about Kirsty is that the fans kinda hate her. And while I do think some of that hate is a tad overblown, I also wouldn't go out of my way to defend her either. She's generally mean to Mario for the bulk of the game, and unlike, say, Midna from Twilight Princess, she doesn't really get any kind of meaningful arc, or even apologize. A lot of her dialogue feels like it's taunting the player directly, which in a game with as many issues as Sticker Star, yeah, I can understand the hate. At the end, Kirsty sacrifices herself to power up Mario so he can take down Bowser, which is supposed to be this somewhat emotional scene, but I, and many others I'm sure, felt no real attachment to her whatsoever. And at the end, Mario wishes for her to come back to life, so like, this meant nothing, really. The whole thing is retroactively played off as a gag. And Kirsty is the one original character that you get in this whole game. Because as we established earlier, all enemies and NPCs are plucked directly out of the mainline Mario games. And you know, it's one thing to not have original characters, but if we're sticking within the confines of just the Mario universe, it feels like there was so much wasted potential here. We'll get into behind the scenes stuff with the Paper Mario series in a later video, but to make things abundantly clear, it was an explicit order from higher up that the game only use pre-established Mario characters. And apparently, though I'm not entirely sure about the validity of this statement given the conflicting reports that I found, but apparently, Nintendo received a lot of complaints from Club Nintendo surveys regarding Super Paper Mario's emphasis on story. The basic idea here being that people just wanted to play the damn game, they didn't care about any story. And whether or not that aspect of the game's development is true or not, it is certainly a fact that the devs were told to streamline things and make them more palatable to casual players. Which is a funny statement considering Paper Mario is RPG, but beginner friendly already. The stringent limitations put on the devs are baffling to say the least, but even with those constraints in place, you could have done so much more. This also is not a good excuse for Bowser having literally no character or personality whatsoever. In the previous three games, Bowser just hit different. He was the epitome of personality with his tough guy exterior and himbo energy. But in Sticker Star, he's a mindless big guy that doesn't say a word, and who only appears at the very beginning and end. Kamek and Bowser Jr. are the closest that we get to true rivals, but their encounters are too brief and shallow to really hold any weight. Having Bowser return to the role of big bad antagonist is already disappointing, but to then take him and give him absolutely no personality whatsoever, yeah, there was just no excuse for that. Chapter 4 is probably the closest that the game comes to reminding me of the older games, specifically with this level that's set in a spooky mansion, but it's still nothing to write home about. It only stands out in the context of this game, where nothing happens. Oh, thank god we have this sepia tone toad. Oh. Oh, it's just the little things. I don't know what I'd do without him. Big Wiggler is another recurring character of sorts, but they're just as shallow as everything else in the game. And the gameplay surrounding this chapter is, uh, infuriating, to say the least. Which, yeah, let's wrap up this section so we can get to the gameplay. Sticker Star feels like the antithesis to Super Paper Mario, which, given everything that we just said, was kind of the point. But it far overcorrected to the point that it felt hollow and meaningless. This feels less like a cohesive world with characters that live in it, and more like a series of levels designed by a game developer. I would like to remind everyone of that little bit of information that I told you to hold on to back in chapter 1. Yeah, Chekhov's floating text. And if you need a refresher on what was said, it was that Paper Mario's name in Japan was Mario Story. And though the name of the series in its country of origin did change eventually to conform with everyone else, let me repeat, the very first game in the series that this game is a part of was called Mario Story. But enough about story and characters. It's Mario, who cares about that? I mean, if the gameplay is good, then surely we can forgive everything else. Right? That is easily the saddest ending to a Paper Mario game. I don't know, maybe Sticker Star will... will 
make that even more so, I don't know. Looking really forward to Sticker Star, which is coming out this fall. Paper Mario Sticker Star was the most disappointing thing since online Smash Brothers. Oh, well now would you look at that. Turn-based battles, the thing everybody wanted to return after Super Paper Mario ditched the concept in favor of a different approach. Well, be careful what you wish for, because the battle system in Paper Mario Sticker Star has been overhauled drastically, and without hyperbole, every single change made to battles makes them worse. Like, it's impressive just how bad every decision made here is. So let's rip this band-aid shaped sticker right off and explain the most significant and controversial change. Nearly every single function in battle has been replaced with stickers. The way this works is that you'll find stickers plastered all over the world. You can get them from blocks, peel them off walls, or even just get them from enemies or stores. Each sticker corresponds to a familiar action from previous Paper Mario titles, jumping, hammering, and healing to keep it simple, plus an assortment of other unique stickers. You've got all your bare necessities, but in order to perform these actions, you have to select a sticker, and once you use it, it's gone. Every function, aside from running away from battle, has been replaced with a consumable item, which is just why. The outcome of this design can, and often does, result in situations where you don't have the right kinds of stickers that you need for a battle. This is especially felt with boss fights. Completing battles does not gain you any form of experience points, but instead grants you coins and some stickers that are typically worse than the ones that you used up to beat the encounter. Coins that you gain from battles really only serve two primary functions, those being to spin a roulette wheel, and the other is to buy more stickers. Also, it goes without saying that FP and badges just don't exist. So then why would you ever go out of your way to battle enemies if you gain nothing from doing so? Maybe you do them because they're fun. No. Here's a quick bullet list of other baffling changes. You can't see enemy HP. You can't select which specific enemy you want to focus your attack on. All action commands are based on pressing A at the right time. And of course, there are no partners. All you can really do is pick from your stickers. But if you're hoping to get more options, well, you could always gamble. Yeah, you heard me. Early on, you gain the ability to use some of your coins to spin a roulette, and if you match two or three, you'll get to use an extra sticker or two per battle. You can straight up pay more to guarantee that you'll get at least two matches, and you'll often end up relying on this function because the key to winning most battles is simply dealing out as much damage as possible. You could argue that there's a fair bit of risk reward here, but like, come on. It can be easy to burn through coins, but the economy in this game is broken, and I never experienced a coin shortage at any point. On a basic and fundamental level, I also just hate what they've done with the numbers. For whatever reason, they're a lot bigger in this game. As a result, it sort of dilutes their meaning, and when combined with the fact that enemy HP is combined so you don't even know what a specific enemy's HP values are, it feels like you're just picking random attacks and hoping that they work. Predicting what stickers you'll need in the future is next to impossible, and this is made even worse by the existence of things. No, I'm not going crazy. These are called things. They're items you find throughout the game that were plucked right out of the real world and can be turned into stickers. And like, these are easily the best stickers in the game. Like, kind of overpowered to the point that they are not well balanced at all. To somewhat compensate, they range in size and can very easily fill up the limited space in your scrapbook, which, side tangent, organizing this thing is a mess, and the further you get into the game, the more annoying it is to select attacks since you have to sort through several pages to find exactly what you're looking for, making what's ultimately still a very simple choice feel bloated and more complicated because of the well over 100 plus stickers you could choose from by the end of the game. But yeah, side tangent over. Things make sorting your stickers more annoying, 
and I'm not a big fan of what auto-sorting tends to do with them. That's not very aesthetic and I've now been overcome with the urge to play Resident Evil 4 for some reason. You can only carry one of a specific thing at a time, and in order to get it back, you either have to trek all the way to the very spot that you found it, or you can drop by Toad Town and pay some inflated prices for inflated rubber. Aw, honey, this is Paper Mario Sticker Star. Did you think you'd be able to just walk up to this shady guy and use the things that he sells you? No, you can't just use things in their thing form, silly. You have to convert them to stickers. Of course! You do this by selecting the ones that you want, and one by one, you fling them at this tarp. You have to watch the animation every time, and the game doesn't auto-sort your scrapbook. So if it decides that there's no room, you then have to back out, auto-sort your stickers, and then you can go back to flinging your things. Look, I want to be upset right now, but the music here, admittedly, is pretty catchy. So let's talk about boss fights, because big shocker, these aren't very good mechanically. They're either insanely difficult or piss easy. I'd argue that it's not even fair to call them boss fights as they're more akin to context puzzles. Each boss has a very specific weakness and barring the first boss fight, plus the one-off fights with Kamek and Bowser Jr., it's an absolute necessity that you have the correct thing sticker. And sure, there are hints that are there to help you figure out what thing sticker you're going to need for the boss fight, but because of how this game is designed, it's entirely possible that you may not have even stumbled upon the necessary thing in the first place. And to compound on this issue further, it's kind of hard to tell when you're even supposed to use the thing. If you don't use the thing sticker for the very specific turn that the game wants you to use it, then you've just wasted it, and it's gone. <laughs> and that means that you'll end up having to do the entire thing all over again. But if you're big brain and you know what the solution is, then it's just a matter of picking your strongest stickers. And at that point, the battle is a cakewalk. Boss battles end up being a whole lot of trial and error, which surprise, not a whole lot of fun when you go into the game expecting to be able to strategize. Even the smaller boss fights that don't have specific weaknesses are annoying. The final Kamek fight at the end of the game is incredibly frustrating because Kamek has the whole gimmick of turning every sticker into a flip-flop that does the exact same thing. Better hope you've memorized what's in your album and that you haven't wasted all of your good stickers because you're not getting those back. This last fight against Kamek is literally impossible without the roulette giving you three in a row. Kamek will just infinitely spawn more clones if you don't take them all out in one go, and because you can't highlight specific enemies, you're just in this constant back and forth that heavily relies on RNG. And the game doesn't save your progress after this fight, which I realized the hard way. So if you die at the Bowser fight, you then have to do this fight all over again. So please make sure to leave, save your progress, and restock on stickers. Matter of fact, I'm going to go do that right now, so we will be right back. Battles are the most obvious area where we can see design choices that don't feel properly considered, but stickers also negatively impact overworld exploration as well. They're plastered all over the environment, which is cute, but that moment of holding A to peel them off gets old after the 300th time that you do it. Paperize mode is a function that allows you to stick specific stickers to key areas to solve puzzles, and the thing about Sticker Star and puzzles is that they are insanely cryptic. As we talked about with the boss battles, for those you need specific thing stickers, and sometimes you just might not even stumble upon them, either because they're incredibly well hidden, or because they were just never on the road to your destination. Let's talk about Chapter 2, and the infamous 2-4, a level that is necessary to complete in order to finish the chapter, and a level whose required thing sticker to complete is found in a level that is the starting point for chapters 4 and 5, and is never once hinted at as a place that you should visit or explore. 
I have absolutely no idea how anyone was expected to figure this out. Chapter 3 is a huge maze that's both confusing as well as tedious, filled with even more cryptic puzzles than Chapter 2. Chapter 4 is kind of a high point in a lot of ways, but still nothing special. And Chapter 5 exists. Until getting footage for this video, I hadn't touched the game since all the way back in 2012, over a decade ago, Jesus fuck. And while I did remember some of the more infamous moments, I still needed a guide. You know, I find it quite ironic that the Paper Mario game, which was supposed to be streamlined for a general audience, wound up being the least user-friendly game in the series. Look, I could show you example after example of cryptic level design, but I think I've made my case here. This kind of stuff is all over the game. That being said, Paper Mario Sticker Star is a game that some people are nostalgic for, and it also has its fans. While that community is rather small, they do exist. And look, I'll be frank with you. If you enjoyed Paper Mario Sticker Star, then I'm happy for you. Genuinely, I would never seek to tear you down or take that away from you. The less people that can be made miserable by this game's existence, the better. I just want to understand you. I feel like a good majority of people who enjoyed Sticker Star are people whose first entry in the series was Sticker Star. But all that aside, the game clearly had to have done something well in order for some people to like it. So what if any redeeming qualities are in this game? Because after all, my entire mission and goal with this series is to find things to love. Well, for one, the game is pretty to look at. It is a bit sad going back to 30 FPS after the last two games ran at a crisp 60, but it's not like the slower frame rate hindered the experience. 30 FPS isn't the end of the world, and this world is very clearly and explicitly made of paper. Everything about the design of this world, whether it be the UI, Mario getting crumbled up, and the whole gimmick of plastering stickers everywhere, makes clear that we've gone all in on the concept of an arts and crafts world. And this decision is rather controversial among fans. But for once, I will actually defend Paper Mario Sticker Star, and you won't hear me say that very often. Paper Mario fans will often say that the games were never actually about paper. Paper as a theme is used as a backdrop for really shallow gimmicks. And while I understand where everybody is coming from, I firmly believe that this was always the inevitable, natural evolution of Paper Mario. Not all of the things that I just complained about, of course, but the paper stuff at least the emphasis on it. I already talked about how I feel about this subject in my video on the first game, and The Thousand Year Door was a game that further pushed the envelope, no pun intended, with paper-centric gimmicks like folding Mario up into an assortment of things. And then we get to Super Paper Mario, which just kind of did its own thing. It's more of an outlier, but as far as more traditional seeming Paper Mario games are concerned, this always made sense. I don't blame people for preferring the classic look, but this new look doesn't look bad in the slightest. In fact, I think the newer Paper Mario games are simply gorgeous. I think people have become more hostile to this art style and paper-themed gimmicks in general because that's really all these games have going for them. This isn't a bad direction, it's just that this direction is now associated with games that were not very good. Stickers, as a theme and concept, could work really well in a Paper Mario game if they were integrated into a system more reminiscent of the Thousand Year Door or Paper Mario 64. But because the concept of stickers was utilized in a game that didn't fully realize that potential and made a lot of missteps, I think that's where everybody's issues come from. This idea is something I want to touch on further when we get to the color splash video, but my point stands. I'm cool with this as the new visual direction of the series, it just needs to have more to it like the special and unique locations that defined much of the most beloved games, cool and unique characters, above all, a better battle system and story. To find something else more positive to say about Sticker Star, I think some moments of level exploration can be fun, and there are even moments where I participated in a battle that wasn't terrible. I'd be lying if I said that there wasn't something kind of fun about amassing a collection of stickers, since Monkey Brain likes to collect things. The one other thing that I guess is worth praising is the music, which is also pretty divisive. And thus far, no contest. In my opinion, this is the weakest soundtrack of the series. 
but it still has some tracks that I quite enjoy. There's even a boss fight where you have to time your action commands to the beat of the song. And that's a really cool concept. It's just that it kind of comes out of nowhere and has no thematic relevance to the boss fight whatsoever, but it still slaps, literally. So for old time's sake, why don't I play a few of the highlights and we'll wrap things up. There is some good in this game. I'll even admit that there are a handful of jokes that caused me to have the slightest of chuckles. We may not have beloved characters like Vivian, but we do have a cameo appearance by trans icon Birdo, who throws a goat statue at Mario, so I don't know what that's about, but that's cool. There are things to like, sure, but I'm not blinded by nostalgia. I mean, I kind of have nostalgia for this game in a sense because it's very old at this point, but yeah, unless you have nostalgia for it, chances are you're probably not going to like it. And I can't really say that I recommend this game to people. I held a personal vendetta and hatred towards Sticker Star for a good while. But in the years since, I don't know, I've just kind of made peace with it. Getting footage for this video frustrated me at points, but the entire experience wasn't miserable. If I wanted to, this video could be several hours long and I could go really in depth with all my complaints, but I honestly don't feel like I have much to add to the conversation that hasn't already been said at this point, especially with all the games that have come after, time and hindsight, I just don't feel much of anything. Back when the 3DS was first announced, I desperately wanted a port of Paper Mario for the Nintendo 64 that I could play portably. Just having that would have made me a happy camper. Hell, I think Super Paper Mario would have been a better fit for the 3DS than the Wii. Think about it. You've got a D-pad for 2D exploration, a circle pad for 3D exploration. The whole selling point of the 3DS is the 3D capabilities. You've got more buttons. I mean, come on, this makes perfect sense. Ports of any of these three games would have been received a lot better. But no, we don't live in that timeline. We live in a timeline where we got 
Sticker Star. And at the time, I was incredibly disappointed. But now, to me, it's just a thing that exists. So that's where I'm at with my journey. I've just learned to accept it for what it is, recognize that it disappointed me at the time, but I don't harbor any resentment. Unfortunately, that's not what I'm supposed to say right now because my take, it's not exactly enough to summon forth the green paper heart. Oh no, is this the end of the retrospective? No, no, of course not. I just need to brainstorm. I mean, come on, there's gotta be a way to get out of here, right? Right, I have other paper hearts and they do shit. Okay, uh, what happened to the red and the orange hearts? That's kind of concerning. Hopefully they still work. Uh, you wanna do something? Yellow heart, what do you do? Yeah, no, that's fine. Just, uh, just, uh, just take your time. I'll, uh, I'll just wait patiently. Wait, what just happened? Did I die? <laughs> no, that doesn't make any sense. Wait, something feels off. I'm back at the beginning of the video. Hmm. Huh. Okay. Okay, okay. I can use this. I've got it. Uh, hi everyone. It's me, JJ, the Zillennial. Yes! I did it! Now what? Hmm. I see something in the distance. This place seems... familiar. Oh, there's a note here. And it's from... Cece! Dear JJ, If you're reading this note, it means I no longer exist. I had to sacrifice myself in order to save your life. So... Sorry you had to find out this way. I have a lot to say, but sadly not enough time to say it all. I just want you to know that I'm sorry. I never meant for things to turn out the way they did. As I'm writing this, I'm not sure how much you'll remember from the past. Sooner or later, you'll probably know the full truth. In which case you already know that all of this is my fault. I was too weak and selfish. And because of that, I hurt you. I don't ever expect you to forgive me but know that I've done everything in my power to make things right. The rest is up to you. You have to finish our quest. A sinister dude is probably out there searching for you, and if they find you, you won't be shown any mercy. You'll need the power of all six paper hearts to defeat them. I had a feeling the fourth paper heart would be the most difficult one for you to get. So, I pulled a few interdimensional strings, and I left you a little something inside this chest that should prove incredibly useful. This was incredibly difficult to find, so please be careful with it. By now, you've probably noticed that the hearts in your current possession seem dim and weak. That's because of the influence of the dark heart, so their use will be incredibly limited. You'll need to consider when to use their power carefully. I also put the book in this chest. Its information should be useful. If you've stumbled upon this place, it means there's hope for you. We've likely used up all the energy in the red and orange hearts, but the yellow one should still have enough power to keep you safe. This heart grants a single revival, but please do your best to avoid using it. You may even consider using it to revive me, but I ask that you not do that. Frankly, it would be a waste. If all goes according to plan, you'll never see me again. And I think that's for the best. Thank you for being a good friend to me all those years. I wish you success on your quest. Goodbye. Well, this sucks. Cece, I don't fully understand everything that's happening, but do you really think that I'm just gonna give up on you? We're friends. End of story. I can't revive you right now. I'm sorry, but there's gotta be another way. I'll figure it out, but right now, I'll do exactly what you asked me to. All right, chest. Let's see what you've got from- Oh my God! 
Uh, is this real? Wait, what's this? P.S. The heart comes from a universe in which Paper Mario Sticker Star was actually good. After completing the mission, it must be returned to its original timeline, so sorry about that. Well, uh, okay. I'm not gonna complain about this. So let's just add it to our collection and continue the Paper Mario series retrospective in the next chapter. Many questions lingered in the air, but with the most difficult to acquire paper heart in hand, things were starting to look up. Only two hearts remained. Hmm, I see you've activated one of my traps. In that case, you must not be very far. <laughs> <laughs> Hi everyone, thank you for watching the fourth installment in my ongoing Paper Mario series retrospective. If you enjoyed the video, I'd very much appreciate all the things that help small YouTube channels like this one. If you want to support me financially, we also have a Patreon, patreon.com slash Dissonance, linked in the description, where you can get things like ad-free versions of my videos, early access, and your name in the credits. Special verbal shout out to Laura Flynn for being in my highest currently available tier. We've also got a Discord server you can join if you want to hang out and be a part of our community. I'm JJ the Zillennial, and next time, we'll be talking about Paper Mario Color Splash. I hope to see you then. <laughs>